Okay, this is going to be called Ruth, a woman every man could learn from. Now, I know today um, a woman's not to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but Ruth is some a, a woman that every man could, could learn from. Ruth has four chapters, 85 verses, 2,578 words, and Jesus Christ is pictured as our kinsman redeemer because Boaz is the kinsman redeemer, and he is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Boaz is Ruth, Ruth's husband. And from them comes uh, Obed and Jesse and David. Uh, Ruth ends up in the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Ruth, the book of Ruth takes place during the time of the judges. You know, the book of Judges, that's when it takes place is during that time. As it says in Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, Now it came to pass in those days when the judges ruled. So for this reason, she uh, pictures a saint who lives right in an insane world. And if you are a Christian in 2021, you can be a saint who chooses to live right in an insane world. Ruth was a Moabitish woman. The Moabites were the enemies of God. So she pictures how me and you were at one time the enemies of God before we were saved. And verses that go along with that is Ephesians 2.16. And it says, And that he might reconcile both unto God and one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And Romans 5.10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We are no longer the enemies of God if, if you're born again. One of two books, uh, Ruth is one of two books that's named after a woman. The other one is Esther, and the author is Samuel. Now, chapter 1. Let's get to chapter 1, and let's look at the characters for a minute. The characters are... Uh, Elimelech, Naomi, Ruth, Orpah, Malon, and Chilion. Elimelech, Elimelech and Naomi are Ruth's father-in-law and mother-in-law. Malon and Chilion were the sons of Elimelech and Naomi, and Ruth and Orpah are the wives of the two sons, Malon and Chilion. So Ruth and Orpah are the daughters-in-law of Elimelech and Naomi. Now, Elimelech... Ruth's father-in-law left Bethlehem to go to Moab, and he took the family with him. And this was a big mistake because Bethlehem means house of bread, and there was a famine in the land of Moab. So this pictures the Christian getting backslid on God and going out to serve the world, and he's going to find out he's just going to go hungry out there. While they are in Moab, Malon and Chilion meet Ruth and Orpah and take them wives. When you leave fellowship with God and go out into the world, you take your family with you, and they're going to end up getting husband and wives out in the world. And it's going to be a snare unto them. But while they are in Moab, Elimelech and the two sons die, and only the three women are left, Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah. Now, Naomi decides to go back to Bethlehem now. Uh, and Ruth and Orpah go with her, but Orpah decides to go back. And Ruth's name means friendship, but you're going to see Orpah's name means stubborn and stiff-necked. She decides to go back to Moab. So Ruth pictures a sinner who accepts Jesus Christ, and Orpah pictures the stubborn and stiff-necked sinner who denies Jesus Christ. But that brings me to my first point about this story. What can we learn from Ruth? She chose God, so you need to choose God. Ruth makes it a step further than good, a good portion of men. She actually chooses God. In Ruth 1, 14 through 16, it says, And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return, return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. So she's saying to Naomi, I'm going with you. I'm going with you back to Bethlehem. And 
I'm choosing your God. I don't want the gods of Moab anymore. Now Orpah, she went back to the gods of Moab. She went back to a place where there's a famine in the land. In 1 Thessalonians 1, nine, it says, For they themselves show of us what mannering in, manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Each and every day, you need to turn to God from your idols. Any idols you got, you turn from them and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ruth chose God when everyone else around her was choosing false gods. When her friend Orpah was choosing the false god, she said, Naomi, I'm going with you, and my God, and your God will be my God. She chose God in the day when every man was doing what was right in his own eyes. That's what men are doing today in 2021. It's all about how they feel. What they feel is right becomes right in their eyes. So Ruth goes back with Naomi to Bethlehem. In Ruth 1, 21, this is what Naomi says. It said, she said, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi? Seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. So she's saying she went out full from Bethlehem when Elimelech took her with him to Moab, and the Lord hath brought her home empty again. So Naomi pictures a backslid saint who leaves fellowship with the Lord full with the things of God and then comes back from the world empty-handed because the world has nothing to offer. But immediately, Ruth goes to work in chapter 2. And this brings up our next point. Not only do we learn from Ruth that we need to choose God in every aspect, but we need to work in the field. Ruth, first thing, goes to glean in the field of Boaz. Boaz is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Ruth is a worker. Most men today are lazy slobs. They don't want to work. Uh, Ruth would outwork them, work circles around them. In Ruth 2, 2 through 4, it says, And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. So Boaz is from Bethlehem, just like Jesus Christ. And Ruth is a type of born-again believers gleaning in the Lord's field. In Matthew 9, 37-38, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So, Ruth gleaning in the fields, that's, that's a picture of us, me and you, who are born-again believers, going out into the Lord's field and doing His work. She, see, she wasn't lazy. And 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That means if you, you sir, out there who are listening to this, if you won't get up and provide for your family, you're worse than an infidel. Now, obviously, I'm not talking to somebody who's disabled or hurt or anything like that. I'm talking to young men who are in good health and can run circles around the house a hundred times that can't go out and work. It's just it's just crazy. And then they're ha having to steal or do whatever else to get the kids food because the man won't go out and work. I mean, if a woman like Ruth can work, then a man should work. In 2 Thessalonians 3.10, it says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Meaning, if you're not willing to go out and work when you're able, as a man, then you shouldn't even be eating. Work for the Lord as well. The more, work, the more you work for the Lord, the less time you have to sin. The less you work, and the less you stay busy for the Lord, the more time you have to sin. In 2 Thessalonians 3.11, it says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. The more you work, the less chance you're going to get to be in everybody's business all the time. 
Another thing you need to do is work in the scriptures. In 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be a workman in the scriptures, and be zealous about it. In Titus 2.14, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. People say, man, you teach this eternal security. You teach this once saved, always saved. You teach this uh, that you don't believe that every Christian is going to have a changed life. So that means you think a Christian can just go and do what he wants to do. Or you're for all this uh, people just living like the devil. Obviously not, man. The Bible is full of places where it says that you need to have good works. You need to live right. You need to do your best for the Lord Jesus Christ. That stuff just has to do with discipleship and not salvation. Don't be wishy-washy. Maintain the good works. In Titus 3.8 it says, This is a faithful saying in these things. I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Now let others see them consistently, even. In Titus 2, 7, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Second Thessal or Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now look at this. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God wants you to work. Ruth worked. Adam was working before the fall. And then he really had to work after the fall. He had to get his food by the sweat of his face. You need to do some sweating. You need to get out there and work. Make yourself be sore. Ruth was also to get a full reward for her work. This pictures us. Because just like we will one day get rewarded for our work. Ruth 2.12 The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. And then for us, in Colossians 3.23-24, it says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of his in of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So Ruth's getting a reward for her work, just like we're going to get a reward for our work. We got to do it with the right motive, and we don't want nobody to cause us not to get a full reward or try to take our crown. The next thing, though, what can we learn from Ruth? Cleanse yourself in the word and put on the new man ruth makes herself known to her kinsman boaz in chapter three but before she does there in ruth 3 3 it said uh, naomi tells her wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee get thee down to the floor but make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking so she told her wash thyself and put thy raiment upon thee so you need to cleanse yourself in the word. This can be a picture of that. Cleanse yourself in the word. In Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify, now look at this, and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Every day you need to take a bath in the Word of God. Cleanse your mind. It's like when you're putting the Word of God through your eyes, it's going through your brain, and it's like you got pipes in there, and that Word's just going through those pipes and like Drano for your brain, just getting that gunk out of there, and it just comes out of you. And if you could see it, it would be sickening. It would probably make you puke if you could see what was coming out of your brain when it was getting a spiritual cleansing from the Word of God. But he also says in Ephesians 4.24, And that you put on the new man. Naomi told Ruth to put thy raiment upon thee. When you get saved, you need to put on the new man. You got something you need to put on. Put on the new man. Put that old man back in the closet, nail him back to the cross, bury him back down in the grave, 
because you want to put on the new man. A lot of y'all are going out leaving the old man on. A lot of y'all come home from church and you're changing out of the new man, like looking like Mr. Rogers or something, changing clothes and putting on the old man back on and then going back out into the world. Make everybody think you're wearing the new man all the time when you're at church and you're putting back the old man on. But you need to put on the new man. And you need to cleanse yourself daily. It's a daily thing. You need to reckon your flesh dead daily. You got to nail the old man back on the cross daily. It's a daily thing. It's not just something you do one time and you're good for a while. You got to do it every single day, multiple times a day. Now, Boaz, the near kinsman, in Ruth 3.12, it says, And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. But that's Boaz speaking. And he's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the last Adam. He is our near kinsman. He came down, manifested himself in the flesh, and died on the cross for our sins. In 1 Corinthians 15.45, it says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was, a, was made a living soul. The last man, the last Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Jesus Christ is the last Adam. He is our near kinsman, and he is our Savior. So that's something you can learn from Ruth. Cleanse yourself in the word. Put on the new man. Now the next thing, go not empty to others. In Ruth 3.17, it says, And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Boaz told Ruth not to go empty-handed to her mother-in-law. He said, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. In Psalm 126.6, he says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You need to go around bearing precious seed. Cast your bread on the waters. When you cleanse yourself in the Word, and you get all that gunk out of them pops in your brain, some stuff is in there that you need to tell other people about, and don't go around empty-handed. Don't go around not being able to give somebody something from the word. Don't go around not being ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. You need to always be ready to give somebody something from the word. Be, be able to tell somebody how to be saved and believe the gospel. Now chapter 4, that you got the marriage of Ruth and Boaz. And this pictures how Jesus Christ married a Gentile bride. Boaz marrying Ruth, who is a Gentile, pictures Jesus Christ marrying the bride, a Gentile bride. Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, it says, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Boaz has taken a Gentile bride, Jesus took a Gentile bride. And the death of Ruth's former husband back in chapter 1 allowed Ruth to be free to remarry. You see, when we got saved, we became dead to the law. And we were free to be married to Jesus Christ. And you can read about that in Romans 7, verse 4, where it says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are, are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. A lot of people say, well, we aren't the bride of Christ. Well, what's Romans 7, 4 talking about? We became dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. All born-again believers make up the bride. Ruth pictures that bride and her. Uh, the, the husbands, Malon and Chilion, picture the law. They died, and Ruth is free to remarry. And she marries Boaz, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. That pictures me and you being dead to the law and free to meet, remarry. And we marry Jesus Christ. So, uh, the next thing is, remember you were bought. You were bought with a price. In Ruth 4.10 it says, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren. 
and from the gate of his place ye are witnesses this day. So Boaz purchased Ruth. In Acts 20:28 20, it says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. The same way Boaz purchased Ruth is the same way God purchased you. God purchased you with his own blood. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood. He was buried and resurrected. He purchased you if you're saved. In 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for the sins of every man. He paid the sin of every man. He bought every man. It's just up to us to accept accept the payment. You got to accept the payment. But Jesus Christ made the payment. He's waiting for you to accept him. And we're bought with a price. So glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's people always going around saying, you, you teach eternal security. You teach easy believism. That's all I hear all the time. These people saying, you just easy believism. You believe a man can uh, be saved and just live however he wants to. I have never said that before in my life. You're bought with a price. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You see, they're always making up these arguments that just don't hold any weight whatsoever. You say, well, I believe eternal security. Immediately, the person who believes you can lose your salvation jumps up and says, you just think you just think a person can get saved and just go live however he wants to. You ever heard me say that in these studies? Then if I say, you know, people who also believe eternal security sometimes watch my videos, and, you know, I say that every Christian will, not every Christian is going to have a changed life. I don't believe that every single one is going to have a changed life. And they'll say, well, you just think that all these people out living like they want to can just live like they want to and they're still saved. That's not for me to decide if that person's truly saved or not. God knows, they know, the devil knows. Not me. Maybe they're not really saved. But I can't determine if they're saved or not just by how they're living. And by saying stuff like that that I just said, that doesn't mean I'm condoning how they're living. And that doesn't mean I think that we should just go live how we want to. I believe in holy living. I believe you shouldn't cuss. I believe you shouldn't watch dirty movies. I believe you shouldn't listen to filthy music. I have uh, standards you probably wouldn't even like. That, Like the people that believe that a Christian, sh uh, that a changed life is required for salvation, the people that teach that, I probably have standards that they wouldn't even want to go by. So to people that saying that I just think everybody should just do what they want, look at all these verses I'm quoting. All those verses about you need to have good works. All those verses about you need to not be a lazy slob. Get up and do something for God. And then here, you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. How is doing, how is... Living how you want to, glorifying God in your body, that doesn't glorify God. You need Everything you do needs to have God in mind. The first thing you need to do when you get up is acknowledge God in your mind. And every decision you make, acknowledge God. Is God going to like this? Is this biblical, what I'm doing? But you see, what these people can't get through their mind is, that doesn't have to do with salvation. That's about discipleship. That's about your state, how you're living from every, any given moment. But Boaz, he's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He purchased Ruth. Jesus Christ purchased us. Boaz was able to pay the price, just like Jesus was able to pay the price. You know why? Because he's God. And Boaz was able to pay the, pri uh, pay the price. Jesus was able to pay the price because he's sinless. Nobody else could have done it. Because they wouldn't have been a perfect sacrifice. Jesus Christ fulfilled all righteousness. He's the only person to ever do that. Everybody else broke the law. But this has been 
another study on the book of Ruth about Ruth, a woman every man could learn from.